Just going, been going through the Psalms and just reading through them and just hearing the heart of uh, what's in them. And I remember, uh, I believe it was uh, Chuck Swindoll was reading through one of his books one time. And he says that the Psalms are like oil in your life. Songs are, you know, songs. They're like oil in your life. And, you know, a good car engine needs what? But it needs to be changed every now and then too, right? So you come back to it for renewal. And there's just something about the Psalms that bring renewal to us. And uh, I got to tell you, it's really been ministering to me. And I'm, I'm just sharing with you what the Lord has shown me in His Word. Um, please stand if you're able for the reading of the Word. Again, Psalm 25, I'm in verse 1 through 7. Psalm 25, 1 through 7, New American Standard Bible. A Psalm of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they have been from old. And do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me for, for your goodness sake, O Lord. Please be seated. I have a title this morning's sermon, Listen, Listening to the Heart of David. And you gotta, you, can you imagine him out there in the middle of a field? And, you know, he used to play a lair, right? And he would play. And the, the, these words, I, you know, just the, you, you would call them lyrics. But I really believe it was anointing of the Holy Spirit as God was moving through him in worship of God that he placed these things upon him. And I'm so glad that he recorded it down. Because every time I come to the Psalms and I read some of these words of God, they wash over me. And they point me back to him. And if there's one thing I really love about David, it's that when you read the Psalms and you hear it, it's always his cry to go back to God. You always hear him crying about God and wanting to be close to him and to worship him. And so you think about it, you imagine yourself, you could say this to yourself right now. Verse one, it says what? A Psalm of David to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Lift up your soul to God today. The soul, you know what your soul is, right? Your soul is the very life. The issue of your life, who you are inside, the spirit that's contained therein, your very soul inside of you. Lift that up to God, because that's what David was doing. He lifted himself. He lifted up his heart and his soul to God. And what? An absolute adoration and love and worship of him. There, I, I'll tell you what, in my personal life, I've never been that close to God before in my life, apart from what? And worship of him. And lifting him up and exalting him. And being blessed with him. Do you understand that? Being blessed with him. He is your very great reward, you know. The fact that you can go before him. I love the scripture where you can go before the throne of God in absolute what? Confidence. When? Anytime. With what? Anything. As if you're going to hide something from God like he doesn't know. It should be better that you should be able to come before the Lord. Absolutely what? Oh, I'm just bare before you, Lord. Just see me. But more than that, see me for who you want me to really be. Help me to see you for really who you are. And help me to see me for what you really want me to be. I come before you. I expose. Why? Because I want him to see truly who I am. And I want to see him as he truly is. Does that make sense? It's just good stuff. What, what else? Well, verse 2 says, Oh my God, in you I trust. Do you? Do you really trust in God? In my, tr my trust, my absolute hope, all, all that I have, my trust is in God and Him alone. Apart from Him, I have nothing. Apart from Him, you have nothing. David's full faith and trust, they're in God. He allows nothing to cause him inner turmoil, to distrust God or question who has his very life in his hand? Nothing's going to get between him and the Lord. Nothing. His utter trust and belief is in God. God has it, what? Under control, no matter what you're going through right now. No matter where you're at in your life personally. 
No matter where the lives are of those in your life, God has it in control. But sometimes we need to what? Trust him. Trust him more. You hear the cry of David's heart for absolute purity as he approaches the Lord. Let me not be ashamed. Well, what brings shame in your life? Sin. Doing everything evil. Doing everything contrary to God. That brings shame in your life. Well, you hear David's cry. Let me not be ashamed. Well, that implies something to me, saint. What does it say to you? He's longing for the purity of who he really is supposed to be. He's longing for the holiness and righteousness of God within himself. A, a desire to be close, that close to God and be able to approach him and to be in his very presence. You hear the cry of David, let me not be ashamed. I don't want to sin anymore. I don't want to do things contrary to you. I want to be holy. I want to be righteous. I want to be in your presence for how long? Forever. I want to come before you, God. Can you be that saint? I'll tell you what, in the sight of God, you're already there. If you be born again, you're already there. And that's why I keep talking about this vision that we need to get. Because God sees you as that. Holy, righteous, true, and complete. In total fulfillment. And we're in this battle. I'll call it the growth cycle. <laughs> as we move towards what God wants us to be. Amen? Every, every, every conviction that you have in your life is something that God is trying to drive out of you that doesn't line up with Him. Why? To bring you into that perfection of what He really wants for you as an individual. That makes sense to me. I, and oh, by the way, I want that in my life. You make mistakes, Pastor Chuck. Uh huh. Just ask Julie. Take her off to the side. She'll tell you. <laughs> Look, she's smiling over there. But Julie makes mistakes too. And we still love each other. And we still love Jesus. And you make mistakes. You make, sometimes you make bad choices in your life, don't you? Huh? You make bad choices. You think somehow or another that God can't enter into that situation and, and give you and grant you the forgiveness that you need, but with a good intent to pull you out of that and put you in his perfect will and where he really wants you to be. The heart of David. You hear the heart of David? You hear it? Listen to it. He wants you to be pure. He longs for purity. He wanted the same. Listen, he wanted the same thing before his God. You see David's perspective as he sees his whole life in the hands of the Lord. I need to grab a hold of that. See, my, not just part of my life, my whole life. What? Everything, everything that represents who you are as an individual, your home, your family, your wife, your children, your grand, your money, your cars, everything that you have, all that you are, all that you ever hope to be, it's in the hands of God. You're in the hands of... Now, I can't imagine a better place to be. Right? If, if, if my life is insecure in God's hands, then something's wrong. Jesus said this, no one can snatch you. No one can snatch you out of who? Out of the hands... No one. Nothing. Nothing can snatch you out of his hand if you be in the hand of God. I need that in my life. Listen. David's protection... And security are founded in the Lord and Him alone. Your protection, your security, you are secure in God. You have a firm foundation. You already know this, right? You have a firm foundation. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 11. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. And another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than that one which is laid. Which is who? Which is Jesus Christ. Paul understood this. And he's passing that on to you. There's only one foundation that's going to keep you secure. What is it? The foundation of Christ. Your marriage, is it built on Christ? Huh? Your home, is it built on Christ? Your, your work, have you, have you built your work upon the foundation of Christ? Are you honoring God in what you're doing? In everything that in your speech, and all that you are as an individual is foundational. Is it foundationally found? I like that. Foundationally found in Christ. 
Because apart, if you're building anywhere else upon that foundation and it's not of God, it ain't going to work out, right? Anything that's evil doesn't make it. If you don't believe that, what was the Bible we were studying this morning? What was it? First Thessalonians chapter 5. Yeah, read, read First Thessalonians chapter 5 tonight and, and look at that. Always be in pursuit of everything that's good, no matter what's going on in the world. Amen? Look for the good. Do the good. Be about the good. And it says, to what? Don't participate in any form of evil, period. Amen? Listen, David, I'm telling you this as your pastor, he speaks to my innermost confidence and security. The word of the Lord that God put into David to speak to us today, the heart of the matter is this. I can be confident in him. I am secure. And I can come before him at any time and know that he hears me and know that he wants to be close to me. I know this with all my heart. He wants that for you. And who or what? Will you trust? Who? Who will you trust? Who? John 10.10 10 says this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And I came that they may have life and have it what? Abundantly. Jesus came that you would have life and have it abundantly. Where do you think you're going to find that life? In Christ. You're going to find it in God. You're going to find it in the Spirit. You're going to find it in the things of the kingdom of heaven. You're going to find it in His peace and His mercy and His grace and His love and His hope and His joy. That's where you're going to find it. You're going to find real life in Him and the things of Him. Well, then who is this that wants to steal, kill, and destroy? And what do they want to steal, kill, and destroy? Your enemies. Your enemies. Your enemies are those who would seek to steal, kill, and destroy your life. Not just from a physical sense, but even more so from a spiritual sense. And that is Satan and the epitome of who he is. And everyone else who's working on his side. What do they want to do? Well, they want to lead you away from everything that is of God. That's what they want to do. They want to kill anything in you that leads you to being right with them. They want to destroy your life, the real life, the, suit, the, the life that you have as, as God experiences it. That's your enemies want to do that thing. So if, if they're the ones that are trying to lead you away from the Lord and the things of God, is that of God? The answer is what? No. First Thessalonians 5 again. Yeah. Listen, I, I can understand exactly what the good is. How? If it's really of God, if it's really of God, if, if the word that is being preached, if the words that are being taught, if the things that you're hearing in your heart, if they tend you and lead you to the things that are good in God, because God is most certainly what? Good. Then it's of him. And if it doesn't, what is it? It isn't good. It ain't, it ain't of God. It's pretty easy to, to determine that. Does it build you up? Does it strengthen you? Is what's being preached and taught and the words that are coming into your heart are they really coming from the Lord? Because those are the three things that will give you. Strength and comfort and edification to build you up in order to enable you to continue to do what? Because i got to tell you, there are times in life when you just want to what? Say it again. Take a nap. Take a nap. <laughs> Throw in the towel. I ain't got enough to go on anymore. And for a lot of people, listen, a lot of a lot of born-again Christians are getting to a point where they're just saying this, I quit. I'm done. I've got nothing left. I can't go on. Because they're basing it upon whose strength? Rather than whose. I come into church. I get into fellowship. If I hang out with you Christians, we talked about this on Thursday night, right? If I get around Christians... And I hang, when I don't want to, my flesh desires to the nap. My, my flesh desires to, I don't have enough to keep going on. But then again, I'm only thinking about who? I'm thinking about me. And I've lost, I've lost, I've lost the fact that my life isn't about me. My life is about everyone else. My life is about everyone else. 
that God has granted the gift that he's given. It's for you. It's for the other people in your life. It's for the people you see on a daily basis. You can't quit. Don't give up. You're going to find your strength in God. Even when you can't make it. You, you, <laughs> listen, God can pour into you so much. And then you wake up the next morning and say, what was I thinking I couldn't make it? Yes, you can. There's something about fellowship, isn't there? There's something about it. And, and here's the thing is that if you're in real Christianity, see, real Christianity says this, and this is my understanding, is that the, the world would want to in, interject into your Christianity and say, you can't ever go and share what you're really dealing with in church. Don't ever tell the people what you're really dealing with. They won't like you. They'll, they'll exclude you. Well, that's not real Christianity, saint. That's not really of God. It is not. It is not of God. What's really of God is when you come in and you share with what you're really dealing with. Like you're going to go before him and pretend like you're all okay, right? You're hearing what I'm saying, right? Oh, I can go before God. He doesn't see that. Right? Well, then what are you going in talking to God for in the first place if he doesn't see it? Why are you going in there? You know you have problems. You know you have issues. And you come before him to come because he's going to give you something that you don't have. The strength and the ability to continue on. And if it's real Christianity, it should be the same way right here in this body, in this church, and in every other church that you're going to, no matter where you're attending. Fellowship, real fellowship, tends itself to encouraging and building it up and encouraging people, inspiring them to press on to what God wants for them. Because I'm not where you're at and you're not where I'm at, but we are in it with, together. It's a strange thought, isn't it? We talk about that because in our minds and our hearts, as if I'm in a different world than you are. No, not really. But in my maturity, my understanding of God, as I continue to press on, I recognize how important, what? Fellowship with God is? Uh-huh. Fellowship with one another is. Amen? You need it in your life. Your enemies are those who would seek to steal, kill, and destroy the life that God has planned for you. Lord, eradicate everything that would come to seek, kill, or destroy my life and my trust in you. That's a prayer. It's a great prayer. Lord, say it again. Lord, eradicate anything that would come to seek, kill, or destroy my life and my trust in you. Do not let any enemy of my soul succeed in drawing me away from you and my utter trust in you. Don't let that succeed. Don't let any enemy of my soul succeed in drawing me away from you and my utter trust in you. Saint of God, think in terms of your very life being on the line, because it is. Just like Peter, when he's about to go under. You know what I'm talking about, right? Remember on the boat? Remember getting out of the boat? Remember walking on the water and doing exactly, he's doing exactly what God wants him to. Jesus has said, yeah. Lord, if it's you, let me call me out on the water. Okay, come on. Peter gets out of the boat. He starts walking. All of a sudden, what's he start looking at? The waves. I mean, there's a storm raging on. He's walking on this water. He starts seeing the waves and the storm and everything around him. All of a sudden, what is he taking his eyes off of? Yeah, but even more so, he starts, he starts thinking in terms of his circumstance rather than the fact that he's walking on the water. It's an amazing thing. And then something terrible begins to happen as a product of it. And it'll happen to you, Christian. When you take your eyes off the Lord, all of a sudden you start sinking into your circumstance. You start sinking into it. And if you're smart, before you go under, what do you yell? Lord, save me! <laughs> Lord, save me! You know, is David any different? Read through the Psalms and see how many times, if you can marry it up with the situations that he's gone through, because Saul is an absolute persecution of him and wanted to kill him and does not send out a few guys. He sent out thousands of men to try and find him. And David constantly avoids them. How's he doing that? 
Like Jesus walking through a crowd. You know, they're going to stone him. They're going to drag him off. And Jesus just walks right through. Why is that? Because your life is in whose hands? God's hands. Your security is in him. And you'd be wise to cry out to him and say, Lord, Lord, save me. I'm sinking. I love the scripture, though. Listen to it. Matthew 14, 28 through 31. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. I wonder in your life right now what you're going through. And, and sometimes you might feel like you're not really sure of the direction of God, right? But you cry out to him, you say, Lord, if it's of you, then, then, then call me out to where you want me to go. And he, he does. What's he say? He says to Peter, and he said, come. And it's like an open door, right? It's an absolute open door. I imagine what Peter was feeling like sitting on the edge of the boat, and he said, the Lord just called me out on the water. <laughs> And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. You imagine this. He's walking right towards the Lord. Oh, man. And then all of a sudden he gets wrapped up. Verse 30. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And it speaks to your situations. Are you afraid? Is there a situation in your life? Are you afraid? Is there something that you're fearing? And I got to ask you, this is fear of God. Not that kind of fear. Fear and reverence of him? Absolutely. But the fear that somehow your life is what? Not secure. You hear it? That you're insecure. You have insecurity in your life. Why? Because you've taken your eyes off of who? The Lord. And Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened, beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And that's really super smart. Okay? <laughs> It is when you're gonna, when you're about to go under, you're about to die. Listen, cry out to God. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, it's okay. It's okay to be in your pain and your sorrow, whatever you're walking through in life, and to cry out to God. Why? That's what He wants. He wants to be included in what? In your life, in every situation that you're walking through. He loves it when you put your faith and your trust and your hope in Him. And not what you can do, but what he is able to do. What he is able to do. What he can do for you. Does the Lord intervene? Well, listen to it. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Listen, I I want you to walk through this in my mind. Even when you cry out and he grabs a hold of you and grabs you in your situation, did he answer your cry? The answer is yes. But does he leave you there? He says, No. Why did you doubt? You understand that? I understand on this level. Even in that moment, Jesus is what? Teaching Peter to trust and rely in him. And he picks him up and he puts him back in what Peter perceives as security, which is what? The boat. Is the storm still raging? <laughs> Are, is the wind still blowing? Why is there security in the boat? Because it's something I can stand on? This speaks to me. I pray it speaks to you. No matter what you're going through in life, what's the boat you need to get into? It's called salvation. What's the foundation that needs to be laid? It's Jesus Christ. It's standing upon him and having that faith in him. And he calls you out of the security zone sometimes to walk with him and towards him. Where's that leading to? I don't know. But I'm going to go. Amen? Sometimes, I'm telling you, sometimes I don't know where that leads. Well, then I'm just going to continue to live out life vicariously. And whatever comes my way, then I'm going to embrace that. If God opens up a door, I'm walking through it. But at this point, the answer is what? Well, you're, you're, you're where I want you to be. That's the answer. You know, you, you, I escape. I got to get out. I got to go find something new. I got to go. No, there's no doors open. Well, then you're where you're supposed to be. And embrace it and love it until God what? Calls you out to some new field or wherever, wherever you're going. I don't know how that speaks to you, but it speaks to me. I'm just letting you know. Does it make sense? It makes sense to me. It's good stuff. Lord, save me. Verse 3. Indeed, oh, we're back at Psalm 25, 
verse 3. Psalm 25. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. The Lord, He will show up. The Lord, He will intervene. He will move you. He will provide. In all of your actions and motives, seek to do good and to be good. Just as the Lord would do, so you do. Do just like He would do. There is no shame in living uprightly and doing good. There's none. There's no shame in that. There's no shame in doing what's right. None. There's shame in everything that you do what? Wrong. And contrary to God. That's what brings shame. This is a pointed question. Am I ashamed of my Lord? Am I ashamed of Him? The answer is no. I freely speak of and about those who are here right now. I can talk about Carlos all day. I can talk about you. Because you guys are here, right? And I have no problem. I don't have no qualms talking about you as an individual. Billy, I can talk about you. Why am I so ashamed to talk about the Lord? What, 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 why is it that, that he should be a regular part of my conversation in my life? Like somehow or another, that's wrong. The Lord is my best friend. He is my Lord. He is my master and he's my God. I would not be ashamed of him. I'm not ashamed of him or what he stands for. He's done nothing but good for me. He's done nothing but forgiven me of all my sins and promised me a home of, in, of eternity. And I should be ashamed of that? I will not shrink back from that. Why? Well, look. Luke 12, 8 through 9. And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. I am required as a born-again Christian to what? <laughs> Confess him before people. Whether they like it or not. But I will caution you this and to say this. Listen for the moments of the Lord. When he would cause you to speak. It might not be a comfortable situation. But then again... Most of, my, most of the most effective ministry I've ever had in my life is not, in, in my mind, is not in this realm. It's the one-on-one -on -one realm. It's the one-on-one -on -one realm. I, I, share, I don't know if I shared this last week or not, but I, and I may have, but I'm going to share it again because it's, just, it's washed over me. Um, young man, God brought in my life. I had a choice. Julie and I had a choice. We had a decision to make. Whether or not we were going to remain in Idaho or we were going to go PCS and go somewhere else. Right? I had that choice. And I began to pray to God about it. Pray, praying and praying. Didn't know what God wanted me to do. We didn't know what God wanted us to do. Whether we should, quote unquote, stay in the military, get out of the military, retire, whatever. And I began to question God. God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I'll do whatever you want me to do. And the Lord said, what do you want to do? <laughs> And I, I, I thought about this, like, what, I'm, I'm trying to have this conversation. God, what do you want me to do? I'll do whatever you want. Where, where, Chuck, if you go wherever you're going, will you honor me? And the answer was, yes, Lord, you know that I will honor. If you, if you get out of the military, will you honor me? And I'm like, yes, Lord, you know that I will honor you. And he said, what do you want to do? <laughs> he put the choice right back on me. And, and so it didn't matter which way I was going. I knew that God was going to be what? And I loved it. Because I got to tell you, that breathed such confidence in me. And I remember getting to the point where I had, we're getting out. And man, I, I'll never forget that day. Oh, my poor commander. Because I wrote out, you know, when you get, you, get, you get your whole ceremony and all that stuff. And within two days, I had that completed. And I had my, you know, my retirement decoration and my paperwork to do all my, and I walked into the commander. I said, sir, I'm, I'm getting out. He goes, Chuck, are you sure about it? I said, yep, sir, I need your signature. He said, okay, here's my uh, decoration and here's my, my ceremony. Here's what I'm planning on doing. He goes, well, okay, great. Uh, how many months are we out? I was like, months, sir? I was like, two weeks. He was like, whoa, 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 no. And I was like, no, yeah, 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 two weeks. He goes, give me that paper back. I was like, no, 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 you sign that. It's mine now. Two weeks, Chuck. 
I, I cannot tell you how many senior leaders I had at Mountain Home Air Force Base come up to me and looking at me going, Chuck, are you sure this is what you want to do? And you know what? You know what I realized? They were not asking me. You know what they're afraid of? Themselves. You know what I heard them saying? What am I going to do when I, what am I going to do? What's the point? Oh, you walk through that whole situation. Fast forward two years later, I'm sitting in a dealership deciding to sell cars where I met Gene and I met Steve Retzlaff. And there's a young kid who's in there. And man, this kid is driving me nuts, right? He's driving me nuts. And we're sitting at a table one day. He's playing around. He's got a rubber band and a diamond. Man, it smacks me right in the eye. I'm like, dude, what are you? lost your mind. But God put him on my heart. God put him on my heart. And I began to fellowship with him. And I began to share with him Christianity. Remember what I was talking about? The one-on-one -on -one relationships. Some of the most effective ministry in my life has been one-on-one. -on -one. And we became friends. And we began to minister to him. And then, of course, his girlfriend came in. Right? And I don't know if you know them, but it's Shane and Sarah Noor. And so Shane's life was headed this way. He was, a wash, he was washing cars in a dealership. Today, he's an E6 in the United States Army. He's also a minister and a teacher and a preacher. He has two children and a wife, and he's got a whole life before him. And this last week, he sent me a text and said, Chuck, he goes, I wanted to send you this, this link. It's to my very first sermon in church. And I'm like, oh. You know, the, you know what the world and the people that were around him would have said about him? The same thing we're saying about me. You'll never become anything. You're nothing. You're worthless. This is your life. You're, you're never going to amount to anything. Really? And God says what? Just watch. And God get a hold of your life. God will touch you. God will move you. David, David went seeking for the Lord, right? No. God saw him and called him. God saw you and he called you. Where's he leading you to? What's he leading you to? If, you, if we would have moved, you would have never left him. I, and I, 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 I say that. I've said that to him. I said, if I had made the choice to go somewhere else, I, you imagine, it, I, I don't know about you, but that washes over me because it's like, you know your life is having an impact. I pray, God, you know that. The Lord's my best friend. He's my Lord. He's my master. I'm going to confess him. I'm going to stand for him. And pray for the opportunities, the one-on-ones that God will bring in your life. That's what we've been asking God for, right? You say, we're just a few people. I, look, your lives are filled with people. You know it as much as I do. Listen to this other scripture, Luke 9, 23 through 26. And he was saying, no, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Your cross, what is your cross to bear? Well, it's not for you. It's for everyone else in your life. Jesus bore that cross not for himself. He bore it for who? You. I'll say it again. So therefore, your cross is not for who? Me. It's for everyone else in my life. What is that to bear? Take it up daily and do it. And follow Jesus. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is it a man, if he profits it, right? If he gains the whole world and loses and forfeits himself. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory. And the glory of the Father and the holy angels. If you're ashamed of Jesus Christ, he will be ashamed of you. Not a place I want to be. Verse 4. David cries out, says, make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Listen close to the very desire and heart of David. He wants to be taught the paths of the Lord. He wants the ways of the Lord. And the ways of the Lord are his manners, his habits, listen, his direction, his journey, his course of life, and his moral character. That's what David wants. He wants the same thing that God has. He wants the same thing that his Lord has. And look, didn't Jesus want the same for us when he says this? 
follow me. Follow me. His journey, his course of life, and his moral character, all those things are his paths, and they are his ways. That is his road, his living out of life. And the way he lives, his travels, and the journey he embarks upon, teach them to me, Lord. Teach those things to me. Where are you going? Where's your journey leading me? (laughs) What direction do you want for my life? What do you want me to say? What do you want me to be? What do you want me to think? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to put my heart and my hand to? All those things David desired. And listen, I hope and pray God you want the same thing. David. David wants to be taught by the Lord. Teach me. That implies that I'm under tutelship with him, right? That means I'm, I'm in discipleship with him. That means that he is teaching me. How does he teach you? Well, I hope he's teaching you right now. I hope he's teaching you when you open up the word of God for yourself. I hope that he's teaching you when you hear other ministers teaching you or whatever they're doing. But I pray God above all things that it's solid, it's real, and it's really of God. Because if it ain't, it's just going to lead you down a bad path. I want the real thing. Amen? Your pastor wants the real thing. And I'm just telling you, I'm trying to give you the best that I can give what I understand in God's word. Verse 5. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of of my salvation. For you, I wait all day long. I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on him. I'm waiting for his salvation. What are you waiting for? I'm waiting for his return. Are you? I'm waiting for him. I'm waiting. Where are you at right now? I'm waiting for the Lord. I'm waiting for him to show up. I'm waiting for his return. Is he going to come back? Yep. David longs to be led by the Lord himself. Don't you? If you got no other leadership going on in your life, that's the best you can have. There, there, it gets no better than that, than to have Jesus Christ himself leading you. And what does he want to be led in? The Lord's truth, the real thing. David longs for the firmness of it, the faithfulness of his truth, the sureness of his truth, the reliability and stability and the continuance of his truth. That's what he wants in his life. The Lord's truth, the Lord's truth, the Lord's truth. You can trust it. You can believe God's word. You can trust him. Everything that he says to you, you can trust him. How do you know? Well, even, look, he's talking to his disciples here. Listen to this. I will ask the Father, I'm sorry, John 14, 16 through 17, New American Standard Bible. And I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper. Who is that? The Holy Spirit. That he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. So, Jesus wants the spirit of truth to be with you for how long? Forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. The world can't receive it. Why? Because it does not know him or see him. But you are different. Do you know the Lord? Have you seen the Lord? Then you are able to what? Have the spirit of truth. Makes sense to me. But you know him because he abides with you and what? Where is he going to be at? He's going to be inside me. How about this one? John 16, 13 through 15. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all of the truth. For he will speak on it, not, not on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. Who's going to talk to you? Through who? The Holy Spirit. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and disclose it to you. The Holy Spirit takes from the Lord, and who does he give it to? Me. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. So everything is the Lord. The Lord uses the Holy Spirit to take it from him, and then to give it to who? You. And he wants this for you for how long? Forever. It's good stuff. Oh, one more. Psalm 51, 6. Behold, speaking of God, you desire truth in the innermost being. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Where am I going to know? What's wisdom? In the Greek, I like it, right? Wisdom is to know the right thing to do and then to do it. That's wise. Because if you know the right thing to do and you do it, that's wise. But if I know the good thing to do and I don't do it, that's not smart at all. That, in fact, that's, that's not intelligent. Like, like what? Like what, Chuck? Well, I, I, I see the burning stove. I always use this analogy, or the hot stove. I know it's hot. And I know that if I reach out there and touch that thing, I'm going to get burned, right? 
but I go ahead and do it anyway. That's not smart. That's just not intelligent at all, right? Because then I'm in pain and sorrow. Get it, right? Real wisdom is knowing the right thing to do and then doing it. Doing the right thing. But not doing the right thing is not, it's not so smart. What does God want for you? He wants the truth to be inside of you and then for you to really participate in true what? Wisdom. To know the good and then to do the good and abstain from every form of evil. Do only what? Good. Tell yourself that. I can do good. I can do good. I can do good. I can do right. I can do right. I can live truth. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Why? Because God's told you you can. And everyone else who's telling you contrary to that, they're not in alignment with Scripture. And they're not in alignment with, with the real Word of God. They're not. Oh, go ahead and sin. Just go ahead and go do all those bad things. Just keep doing those bad And then come back and ask God for forgiveness and then go do it again. Is that really of God? Is that really what He wants for you and me? And the answer is what? No. Be led by the Lord, who will always lead you in the truth. Imagine this, that the Lord himself will teach you in regards to such requests as this. When they're real and your heart is crying out to him, the Lord longs for and desires his truth to be in the very inner core of who you are as an individual. I long for his living spoken word to be spoken by the Lord into the heart of me. His living spoken word. In the Greek, it's rhema. The living spoken word. Every time the living spoken word is spoken, it becomes reality. Every time. Every time that he speaks rhema, it becomes reality. Even in the sayings of Jesus Christ, like the rhema, the sayings, when he says those, what happens to that word? Where does it go? It goes, I can't, it goes inside. And it has its effect. And it's always tending and leading you to what? To good, holiness, righteousness, and truth. I need that in my life. And I long for it. You are to learn from him. You are to be taught by him and to be trained by him. It's called discipleship training, right? The Lord is the God of your salvation. You wait for him and you eagerly look for him. And it is he whom you are in expectation of. It is he in whom your hope is in, your faith and your trust, just like David was. Look at verse 6 and 7. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they have been from old. I like some, some versions render they are forever. They are for eternity. What? His loving kindness and his compassion. They are from old and they are for what? Forever, for eternity. Do not remember the sins of my youth, or my transgressions, but according to your loving kindness, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. David cries out to the Lord to remember the seed of his mercy and his compassion, and for him to be moved into the inner core of God himself, what? Into his loving kindness and his goodness. He cries to the Lord, Lord, remember your own goodness. Remember your own kindness. Remember your own faithfulness. That, that which is contained in the Lord's loving kindness is born out of his love for you. Remember those things, Lord. Remember you. Remember your goodness. Remember your grace. Remember your hope and your love. Remember all those things that you have inclined towards me when you gave me grace when I got born again. Remember your peace and all the things that are of you. Remember your kingdom. Remember everything that you really have designed for. Don't remember my sins anymore. Don't remember all the bad things I've done, God. Remember you. Remember why you've called me. Remember that it's you who's made me holy. You have made me righteous. You're the one. Remember, remember you. Don't remember, don't remember my bad. Remember, remember the good that you have intended for me. And I got to tell you, as a, as a born again Christian, it's a really great reminder to me. Because again, I have this picture in my mind of exactly who God wants me to be. Exactly what he wants me to be. in holiness, righteousness, and truth. And all that he's designed for me as an individual. And I see that he wants to wipe all the bad out of me and remove them from me as far as east is from west. Never remember my sins anymore. In the hope that I will take on the same heart and mindset and finally lay hold of that for which he's called me heaven for. for. To take hold of it. To forget all the bad. Because everything, all your past, all that you used to be is not you anymore. That person is absolutely what? In his sight, dead. 
I, I've been threatening to come into church with a handcuff with a dummy with an old dead man and walk around church like that, you know. Try to set him up in a chair, try to feed him. And why am I continually want to be latched on to that old guy? Why do you? He's cut it off. That person's dead. That's not who you are. That's not who you are supposed to be. Who you're supposed to be is what God sees you as. You're his child. He loves you. He is the God of your salvation. And David cries out to him for that. The qualities of God are forever. They are everlasting and they endure. They will never wear out. They are perpetual. I really love that word. You know the word perpetual? We use it for clocks, right? Perpetual motion. You set it in motion, and in theory, if it always was working that way, it would never what? It would never quit. What, what causes it to quit? Friction. Something, something, that, something that is holding, standing against it. Something that's in the way, right? But in theory, if you could have perfect perfect, per, perpetual motion, it would never what? Everything of God is in perfect perpetual motion. His love endures forever. It will never stop. His peace will endure forever. It will never stop. The things of God will never stop. They are continuous in existence. They are indefinite and most definitely unending. And guess what, saint? They are yours. They are yours. He's given you everything that you need for what? Life and godliness. Listen to the heart of David. He recognizes the things that are not of God are not eternal. They never lead to good, and they only bring sorrow, pain, tears, and regret. It is no wonder David cries out to the Lord to not remember his sins, but to remember his own loving kindness towards him and God's own goodness. David's heart longs for him who is eternal and all that is of him. How about you? How about you today? Are you longing for that? I am. Set your heart on him. Set your heart on him. You want to know the heart of David? That's it. Because he was a man who was after the very heart of who? God. And yet even in the midst of all of his failures and everything he did, his, his mind and his heart was still set on who? God. And he, and he says it. Remember? Remember we, were, we did that last week, right? Last week's sermon says, and I will... He loved the emphaticness of it. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. God is my God. He loves me. He cares about me. I would ask this, though. Do I care about him? So often in our Christianity, we walk in that way, you know. It's all about who? Me. When will it ever transition where my life will transition? And I'll begin to ask, is it about you? Will I genuinely take interest in God and what he's interested in? Will I lay hold of his desires and the things that are in him? Not my desires, his. I want his desires to be mine. Does it make sense? I just want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you today. Into the heart of David? Yeah, but even more so into the heart of God. Go get close to him and watch. Go get close to him and watch your life change. And even when you struggle, Listen, even when you feel like you're up to this much in the water, just be smart and do what? Cry out to him. He'll lay hold of you. He'll pull you out of the situation. He'll rebuke you and say something to you, but always with good intent, because the intent in that moment for Peter was to turn him to what? Faith and trust in him. Trust God. Trust also in me. Jesus said that. Trust God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. There's a place for you and me in his kingdom. Amen? If I had never been born again, I would have went to the Old Testament and read through that. I would have never seen anything in Jesus in there. I would have never seen the power of the Holy Spirit. But as a product of being born again and the Holy Spirit coming into my life permanently, 
Well, when I read through and I study and I, I look and I look, I see who? It doesn't matter where I go, I see Jesus throughout the scripture. Amen? And how it points back. So what does he really need? Well, I know. Let's pray. Most gracious and holy for I, I pray for this young man. I pray for his life. I pray, Father God, that you'll bring Christians in his life that will turn his heart to you and to your son Jesus. And let, that through it, Father, that you'll bring him the power of the Holy Spirit in his life to open his eyes and his heart to see the truth of your scripture and all that is contained therein, both Old Testament and New, in light of the New, Father. I just pray for him and ask again that you put, you put people in his path, Lord, that can open him. And more so, Father, that your Holy Spirit would speak to him, even in his dreams. Even Go speak to him yourself, Lord, and teach him. We cry out for him, Lord. We cry out for him in his soul and his spirit. I pray that you turn him and help deliver him into what you want him to be. What you would call him home to your kingdom for, Father God. I just work, I, I pray for this, Lord. I pray for this young man. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? If when you give the best of your service and ignore the Savior is come, be not dismayed. Oh, uh -huh.